Good morning, brethren. I'd also like to welcome our brethren on live stream. We're glad to have you join us this morning as well. Brother Ricky is going to be teaching from 2 Timothy 4, verse 8. <clears throat> Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. <clears throat> Paul is writing to Timothy because he's at the end of his race. Paul said that he's fought the good fight, he's finished his course, he's finished his race. And so he's encouraging Timothy to do the same. To en he's encouraging him to continue to preach, be instant in season and out of season, to exhort and to rebuke and to correct the things that, um, to reprove um, with all long suffering and doctrine. He's also warning him that there are going to be those that are going to turn from the faith. <clears throat> those who will have desire to have their, have itching ears that they might be soothed from another means besides the gospel of Christ. And so he comes to the end and he's talking about this crown of righteousness. And we know that there is a certain attire that the Lord has fashioned for his saints. He's the one that has tailored it and fashioned it. And we read of this in Revelation 19, verse 8, and it says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. <clears throat> a part of that garment is also a crown, and we know that ordinary people do not wear crowns. We know that it is specifically set aside for royalty, only those who are royal. <clears throat> and if you know anything about crowns, um, most of them are fashioned for a specific king or a specific queen. There's not just a, a standard crown for each, each royalty. There are specific ones. <clears throat> this is so that we can know who this crown, bo crown belongs to. In addition, there are certain crowns that are worn for certain occasions. <clears throat> just as the crown reveals who the one is adorning it, we too will have a crown that will, that will reveal who we are and where we are from and who we are begotten of. While it is true that the people of God are kings and priests now, it has not yet been revealed who they really are. But in the day of the Lord, when the righteous judge, cr judge crowns us with the crown of righteousness, it will be made known who belongs to the Lord of glory. The crown of righteousness signifies that we are indeed righteous. Amen. This crown that the saints will be given <clears throat> will directly match who they are in the Lord. And these crowns will, will reflect the goodness and the glory of the Lord as well as his righteous judgment. Mm -hmm. And there will never be a time where this crown will be abused. Now we, we live in a world and in a time where there have been crowns that have been abused. People have taken the power that they've been given and they've used it for themselves, but not in this world and not with this crown because we will be made perfect as he is perfect. <clears throat> and this crown will not be given by an angel or by any other man. <clears throat> this crown will be given to the saints by the righteous judge. God is righteous in all of his ways and his judgments are true and holy. I can see how Paul was very clear when he wrote this letter. He wanted Timothy to know that in all things he would in suffer and endure in this life, <clears throat> excuse me, for the sake of the gospel, <clears throat> God would adequately recompense him with this crown because he, was, he would judge it rightly. Amen. <clears throat> and we live in a, a fallen realm where there are judges who may have a righteous judgment. We might run into one that is, is a, a saint and that has righteous judgments. But we also live in a time where there are unrighteous judgments. But the Lord does not make unrighteous judgments. So I ask, when God passes a judgment, who can stay it? Who is the one that could thwart or overthrow the righteous judgment of God? And we see this in the account that Zechariah wrote concerning Joshua the high priest. He said, And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, <coughs> and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, 
The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Amen. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. Amen. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, a righteous judgment. And I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. Does that sound like the change of raiment that we'll receive, the fine linen? And I said, let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So that they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. This was a judgment that was passed by the righteous judge, and it could not be overthrown. <clears throat> So the crown, this crown that we're, that's going to be given is not going to be given to just anyone. It's going to be given to them that love his appearing. Amen. By faith, the saints of God take hold of the promise. Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. This is a very real promise that the Lord has given that his people can take a hold of and they can trust in this promise because he is righteous. The posture of the saints is looking up. They're looking and they're waiting. They're waiting for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Just as Simeon was waiting for the consolation of Israel, the people of God are waiting for that great and terrible day when our Lord will break through the sky and we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. <clears throat> we love the Lord even though we have not yet seen him. But as the Lord gives us increase in our faith and understanding, we long to see our Lord face to face. Why is this? Why, why is there this loosening grasp of the world and the tightening grasp of, of seeing our Lord? It's because we're being transformed into his image. We're being made like unto him. <clears throat> Those who are born again have the same spirit as our Lord. He is anticipating the return just like we are. <clears throat> and our home is with the Lord, and our reign is with the Lord. <clears throat> Waiting and watching for the return of the Lord will dictate how a person lives their life. Amen. If a person does not have a love and a longing for the return of Christ, they will live a very unintentional and a very self-centered life without a, the thought of God even being in their thinking. On the contrary, if the person has a keen awareness of the promise of the return of Christ, that person will shape and form their lives around this great promise and look for that day with much anticipation. If you love the appearing of Christ, then you will be preparing with great anticipation. Loving his appearing is a natural, a natural response for the new man. This is the posture of the new man, is a looking, looking for the appearing. If you have the hope of the appearing of Christ and the hope of seeing him, then you are purifying yourself even as he is pure. <clears throat> Loving the appearing of Christ will enable you to stand in the evil day and, into, and endure unto the end. And at his, at, as it has been said many times before, <clears throat> what you love, you will devote yourself to. Uh -huh. This is in any matter. Everybody loves something, yep, right. and they anticipate something, and you give yourself to whatever you love. Uh -huh. If you love the things of this world, you will give yourself to worldly things. Yep. But if you love the appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, then you will make your calling and election sure and gladly make yourself ready for that day. Amen. So, brethren, as we begin this latter portion of our preaching festival today, um, we have an opportunity now to gather up resources. And, and we say this a lot when we're starting a meeting, but this is really what, what we have here. We have a time where the Lord has, has given our brethren these things to speak and to proclaim, and then we're to gather those things up so that we can be ready and that we can love his appearing more. <clears throat> so, brethren, I want to exhort you with this. There will come a day when all of those who preached the word, all of those who loved the truth, those who endured sound doctrine, 
those who died to themselves, those who were so sober and endured afflictions, and those who made full proof of their ministry and offered themselves unto God as a living sacrifice, and those who are looking and longing for the Lord to break through the sky will all be gathered together in one accord mm -hmm. and in one body for a day of coronation. This is the day of coronation from our Lord. When the righteous judge will crown those who loved his appearing and the bride of Christ will take the place God has prepared and there will be no more going out, but rather we will sit on the throne with our bridegroom. So brethren, I encourage you to increase in your love for the appearing of Christ. Amen. I want to give you a greater context here. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. This is one of those personal testimonies by Paul that uh, anybody who's walking by faith can take this up into their own mouth because this is in all of our hearts. And I'm glad that not only Apostle Paul, but godly men in the past have, have given these kind of expressions. Uh, they draw out, so to speak, from our heart what we desire, because we desire the same thing. And so when I say this, this will be something you can take up in your own heart and, and sincerely take it up. This is really our hope, just like it was Paul's hope. Paul's a believer just like we are. Okay, so that, that's important to see that about Paul. I, I don't mean to bring him down, because he had certainly received more than any man had ever received, and, but, uh, but he was a believer, and he had hope just like we do. Verse 6, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. There are a lot of things that will be taking place in the day of his appearing. Sister Tasha brought up a number of things uh, involving rewards for God's people, for their faithfulness to Christ, involving our own personal change, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, involving what Paul calls righteous judgment here in this text. He also mentions it in the first verse of this chapter, speaking of righteous judgment from God, because, of course, he's speaking in the midst of a lot of injustices that are taking place, but God's people are waiting on God to right all the wrongs, and that will take place in that day. The day of his appearing shall be teeming with the divine activity. And yet the thing that the saints want more than anything else in that day is him that is going to appear. That's the thing they want more than anything else. Loving his appearing is primarily a love for the one who's going to appear. Amen. Very important that we see this. And this kind of love, I will show you, has been demonstrated throughout all of history by anybody who has walked by faith, has had this as like a driving principle in their life, is to know God and to see him and to know him more. And I'll show you that. That's not, that's not unique to Christ. It is a part of walking by faith in general, is that all men have had this. The psalmist himself declares this, one thing have I desired. Or from the, from the new, for new International Bible, it says, One thing I ask of the Lord. Brother Gibbon has said this before, and I thought it was a good question. If you could ask anything of the Lord and get a, get a guaranteed answer, what would you ask? What would you want? What do you want, brethren? What do you want? Amen. This is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon... Why do men come into the house? Sometimes people come, they've got different motives when they come into the house. Here's the motive a godly person has, to gaze upon, to gaze upon, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. That's what I want. I want to gaze upon him. I don't want a casual glance. I don't want that. I want to gaze upon the Lord. I want to see him full face, to see as much of him as I can. And that is the, that is the driving compulsion behind Paul's words here in 2 Timothy, to Timothy, okay, when he talks about loving his appearing. We know that this is his driving compulsion because he, when he wrote to the Philippians, he said this, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth of those things which are before, 
I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And what was that prize? Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. That's what this day was preeminently to the Apostle Paul. This is the day when we win Christ. Okay? And so this is, this is not only the desire of the Apostle Paul, this is the desire of all godly people. I just wanted to, I'll come back to that later, but I just wanted to kind of lay that down as we look at that because that's the kind of direction I'm going to move. Now, as Sister Tosh had already said, all men are living really for one thing. All men. I don't care who they are. Okay? We may have at one time been serving, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, but that was all driven by one thing. A love for self and a love for sin. So all men really are really living for one thing. Okay? Whatever man seeks more than anything else in life is the object of his love and strong desire. That's what it is. Okay? And if you spend very much time with someone, you'll, you'll understand what that is. I used to tell people that in Florida. So they'll just spend a week with you. And by the end of that week, I'll have a pretty good idea of what you love. Because what you do and what you don't do, what you prefer to do, what you decide not to do, what you talk about, all that is an index into what a person loves. Okay? And that's not as mysterious as it may appear. Okay? Let me just give you some names. And in, the, in giving you these names, I'll give you good and bad ones. I don't, I'm not asking for an answer here, but, but it'll become very obvious what they love. Some very specific things that will come to your mind. So let me just mention these names. Abraham. Moses. Achan. Jezebel. How about Zacchaeus? Good example. How about Mary, Martha's sister? Or how about Peter? Or how about Judas? Or how about Paul? Or how about Demas? See, all these people, it became evident what they wanted in life. Because that's the way God has made men. God has made men to desire something. And for that desire to be the thing that dictates all that he does and all that he says. Okay? All men are living for something, yes, amen. a very specific something that dictates their priorities in life and the direction in which they live. What you love dictates the direction in which you are living in life. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so serious, as Brother Mike said, to, to pass over the love of God. See how serious <laughs> that is. Yeah. Because you will never love God until you can see his love for you in some measure. We love him because he first loved us, and that love fuels a longing for God that moves a man to live in a single direction so that he comes to the end of his days, having passed through all kinds of difficulty, and he says, here's what I'm looking forward to. I love his appearing. Amen. Okay? Amen. Now, Paul, Paul is a marvelous example of a man passing through all kinds of things in order to obtain this one thing he wanted, okay? And I, what I'm going to say here, I'm not trying to, trying to move in a direction of let's talk about suffering. I, that's not what I want this to be as a lesson about suffering. But I do want for Paul to be lifted up as an example of how much a person loves God by, will, by being willing to pass through all manner of difficulties in order to obtain what God has prepared for him. So that's how I want to, I want to go about this opening, just to show the compelling nature of this kind of love. Paul was no stranger to suffering. Um, whenever Christ commissioned Paul, he was on the road to go down to Damascus, doing what he conscientiously toward God was doing what he thought was right. He was going down to Damascus to take these people that were part of this way. He saw as a threat to what he knew about God and the law, and so he was going to take care of them. Paul was not some violent murderer as he's been portrayed at times. He was doing this for God. And going down to Damascus, on his way down to Damascus, he was met on the road by the glorified Christ. 
Now, in the midst of this conversion process, God draws one of his own people, Ananias, who's actually from that city, who probably would have been arrested by Paul if he had found him out. But Paul becomes the one who arrests him, so to speak. But nonetheless, he comes to Ananias at the, in the night hour and tells him that he is to go down to a, a street called Straight to inquire in a house for a man named Saul. Now this immediately threw up caution flags for, for Ananias because he knew about this man. Paul was not, Paul was not mediocre at all. He was not half-hearted in his service for God. And if he thought this was the right thing to do, he was ready to take care of this. And he was aggressive in what he did. And I, Ananias was concerned about this. We have heard about this man. I mean, he is, he is taking the church apart and hailing men to prison. But in the midst of that, the Lord encouraged Ananias with these words. He said, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And then he says this, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. In other words, Paul was going to, Paul, when it came to suffering, was going to kind of be in a category of his own, so to speak. I, not that his sufferings would be different than our sufferings, but the intensity of them. I don't know of anybody who suffered as much as Paul did. I don't know. I, I can put what I can hardly call my sufferings in the same place of Paul's sufferings, and it doesn't amount to much of anything. It just doesn't. It's suffering. It's legitimate because every man that is righteous suffers for the name of Christ Jesus. God, Jesus has appointed it. But Paul, Paul was particularly lifted up as an example for suffering. Okay? And I'm going to show you just a second as to why. He endured an unusual measure of suffering. He himself, when writing to the Corinthians, was compelled, brethren, to speak this way toward them because they, wouldn't, they weren't receiving him as an apostle, astoundingly. And so... This is what he gave as his credentials in 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 30. It's a little lengthy, but it's going to show us what kind of sufferings he went through. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure. Think about that. I mean, just to receive the stripes 49, you know, 50 minus 1, one time would be something, but Paul couldn't even count how many he had gotten. He couldn't even. That's, that's astounding. In prisons more frequent, in deaths oft of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hungering and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that, that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches, who is weak and I am not weak, who is offended and I burn not. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. He went through an amazing amount of suffering. A lot of difficulties, things without, things within, things that God could have kept him from going through. But he passed through them anyway. Okay? The work of his ministry was carried out faithfully with a continual awareness of impending afflictions in every place he went to minister. It'd be one thing, brethren, to carry out your ministry not knowing what you're going to pass through. Most of us fall in that category. But some of us who God has set up as a particular example of suffering for a reason. He told him what he was going to go through. And he warned him that in every city he would come to minister, he would face suffering. Before it happened. Okay, Brother Gibbon. Yes, there's, a, there's a man of the kingdom here that the more you get from God... <coughs> You get it <coughs> while you're suffering. Mm -hmm. that, that's the thing that was carried out in Paul. 
Mm -hmm. He was in prison, so see, he just it wasn't languishing in prison. He was receiving yeah. things. Mm -hmm. Same with the prophets. So they <coughs> they get their message while they were suffering, mm -hmm. while they were exiled, or mm -hmm. whatever. And this is the way the kingdom of God is. If a person tries to avoid suffering, they will not get much from God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. may, oh. They may study and do a lot of stuff, yeah. but it will not. Be, nothing will clear, really clear up to them. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. uh, and I know that there are a lot of Christians that live to avoid conflict and this sort of thing, but in the process of avoiding that, their souls are drying up. Uh -huh. and that's how God's. That's how God set this up. You just don't get it unless you go through a battle. Mm -hmm. That's the way it is. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's right, Sister June. And Paul got more. Yeah. But he, it isn't. He got a lot, so he suffered because he got a lot. I was just says what that's true. But he got it when he was suffering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. When his yeah, flesh yeah. was handicapped, that's when he got it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, the, the suffering of the saints serve a, uh, a very real uh, ministry to to themselves. I mean, let's face it, we know in ourselves that we will not we will not give ourselves at great expense to something we're not really convinced of. Uh-huh. Right. So it's a witness yeah. to ourselves mm -hmm. right. that our faith right. is is a real faith. But also uh, this came to me whenever I was I was trying to make sense of why there was so much persecution of the saints. Now I was aware of it at that time more of the like the first and second century saints. Since then I found out that this is not unique to the first and second century. That in every generation there have been our brethren who have who have gone through very deep waters and have suffered the loss of all things because they would not deny the faith. Uh, but nobody, there are people who are deceived and they'll give themselves and suffer for something that they think is the truth. But nobody suffers intentionally and willfully for what they know is a lie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And Paul, the, his sufferings, his great sufferings, in a manner of speaking, ratified the truth of his ministry. Mm -hmm. That's right. And the yeah. reality of his message. Mm -hmm. And the, the apostles, they went to their death with the possible exception of John, and they tried to kill him. They, they went to their deaths, like painful deaths, not denying, and if anybody had known that Jesus was a fraud, they would have known. Mm -hmm. But their death put the seal to their to their witness of who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. And so, and God never leaves us. It says He's not unrighteous to forget your labor of love. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's why you get something in suffering. That's right. The Amen. Lord is there yeah. mm -hmm. to minister to you. Amen. That's right. Now, now Jesus, when he was made flesh and dwelt among us, as he grew in wisdom, mm -hmm. in stature and favorites, he didn't know all this stuff just automatically. <clears throat> now we're called in the fellowship of his dear son. Uh -huh. yeah. Now it's in that fellowship that you experience, like he experienced opposition. Mm -hmm. Every step of the way in his ministry, mm -hmm. he experienced opposition. That you're called into that into that process, mm -hmm. and when you see this, love not the world, like whether Jesus ministered and love not the world. See that makes perfect sense mm -hmm. when you see this, because if you if you hobnob with the world, the heavenly spigot is turned off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I don't think a lot of professing Christians know this. Mm -hmm. So they remain abysmally ignorant for decade after decade after decade. And it's because they've not been willing mm -hmm. to lay down their life for Christ's sake. Mm -hmm. See? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. what you do when you suffer, you're laying your life down. Yeah. That's right. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, well, just what Brother Gibbons said, that people are the heavenly speaking. That's what I was trying to say about getting our supplies from God. You get to a point, you, you, there are some places you go to, 
the supply line is cut off. God's not allow. He's not going to allow it. Another thing I was thinking about when Sister June said, people won't die for a lie, and some people are deceived. And some whites think, well, that's not, you know, that's not fair. I mean, they're deceived. It's not their fault. They're deceived. No. They're deceived, and they're going to be judged for that be being deceived. Nobody is de deceived innocently. Mm -hmm. and when, it, when it comes down to judgment day, God is going to be right, and everybody else mm -hmm. is wrong. Amen. And, like, Paul is a good example of this. He was, he was really entrenched in this, the, with the Pharisees. I mean, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. But when he saw the truth, when he saw Christ, he dropped it. And came to Christ. Mm -hmm. He didn't continue with it. Right. I mean, so we have people that were, they, they believe in um, Allah and Buddha and all this other stuff. But nobody's going to get to heaven and say, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Not one person. Right. Amen. And this, whenever Christ came to the earth in, in the form of sinful flesh... And likeness, I should say, of sinful flesh. He came as a man in God. We see the world's enmity against God in yeah. in yeah. its response to Christ. Yeah. Yeah. The way it, it couldn't hear what he had to say mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. because it was not of the Father. Right. The the animosity to get rid of it, uh -huh. to, to uh, away with him, will not have this man rule over us. That's right. He, yeah. We won't submit to yes. his words. We don't want to hear it. And there have been times whenever they stopped their ears and threw dirt in the air and wanted to throw him off a cliff. And I mean, there was a, a strong opposition mm -hmm. yep. to what the Father was saying, what yeah. God himself would. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Mm -hmm. So this is against, this is against God. Yes. Every opposition of Christ is an affront to God himself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, as his people, Brother Given mentioned, you know, that, um, that this fellowship, well, see, that's it. Jesus would not deny fellowship with the Father in order to be friends with the world. Mm -hmm. That's the same principle that's operating right. in his people now. Right. In our measure, according to our understanding, as we have fellowship with him, then we are cut off from the fellowship of the world. Mm -hmm. Because it's not you shouldn't have, you can't have. Amen. You cannot be the friend of mm -hmm. God's enemy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And remain God's friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> Those that were opposed to Christ, now if you just step back and looked at them according to appearance, a lot of them are probably good neighbors, mm -hmm. kind people, mm -hmm. thoughtful people. And, but they but when they confronted with Christ, it brought something out in them that you had never seen otherwise. And there are, there are a lot of people that are they're like good neighbors, they're nice people, they're industrious people. But when you bring up this thing about the Lord and then you find out they're hostile, yes. that's where the suffering comes in. That's right. The fact that they have this appearance of being kind and yet aren't, see, that's part of the suffering that adds to the yeah. uh, suffering because you maybe have the <laughs> high hopes that this would be a good person so mm -hmm. forth. But you find out he's not at all. Yes, right. That's right. I but imagine that was one of the hurts of being in perils of false brethren. That's right. Mm -hmm. and that oh, was yeah. a sharp uh, wound. Yeah. But see, what, what compensates for that, mm -hmm. tips the scales, is when that, while that's going on, God turns right. on the flow of mm -hmm. grace to the yes, individual. Yeah. Yeah. And so he's got to sever this other he's got mm -hmm. to sever right. this other relation to give you these right. precious things. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's the oil behind the wall. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. 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 yeah, I was thinking that's why there's such a there's a misleading message going out there that that Jesus is here to make you happy on the earth. And that's not to say that you aren't happy in the Lord. There's a lot of joy in the Lord, but it's different than what most yeah, people right. picture, you know, what mm -hmm. happiness and joy is. And there's peace in the Lord and things. So if you're not suffering in the Lord, if you're not suffering, then you're really not having fellowship with the Lord. Because you're going to have suffering. That doesn't mean that you're going to suffer every second of the day. And it's just mm -hmm. this yeah. dirge kind of thing. Because there's peace and joy, but there's suffering. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. right. The cup is... 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the mm -hmm. flesh that's mm -hmm. suffering. Or bitter herbs. Yeah. Yeah. You got to eat the supper with bitter herbs. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Absolutely. Yeah, amen. <laughs> you know, when Paul, uh, when Paul spoke to the Ephesian elders, I this this word to these elders has been. It has been precious to me to go over this continually. Um, one of the things that he said to them is he said, Now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem. In other words, God was compelling him. It's kind of like the kind of compulsion that was found in Peter when he said, When thou art older, someone will come and take you where you didn't want to go. And this was kind of like that because Paul knew there, there was bitterness associated with this, but he was bound by the Spirit to move in this direction. See, that's right. Not knowing the things that shall befall me, at least not specifically knowing, but knowing generally what would befall him indeed. Save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every, every city, brethren. Think about how many cities Paul went into. Every single city Paul went into, this was what the Holy Spirit was telling him, okay? Save that the Holy Ghost witnessed in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. In other words, Paul, as long as you are ministering for me, this is what's going to accompany your ministry. Yeah. You know, they, you know, they were damned, right. misdelivered, what else? They, 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 yep, the prophecies right. delivered. And so, the, but the brethren interpret those prophecies to mean you shouldn't go to Jerusalem. Mm. <laughs> yep. Right? That's what the brethren oh, said. Yeah. Well, well, no, better not go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, their love to Paul compelled them to say something like but that. But these are real brethren. See, they, these yeah. weren't fake brethren. These are yeah. real brethren, but this thing went deeper than they yeah. Yeah, did. realized. And Paul saw it. He didn't, he didn't say, well... After all, the Lord speaks to everybody, so maybe, maybe I got to consider this. He, no, he knew. He, and so when these prophets spoke, this compelled him all the more to go. Mm -hmm. That's right. Amen. Amen. And that's what he said. He said, none of these things move me. Not even a millimeter, brethren. Not even that much. He wasn't, he wasn't moved at all by this. No doubt it was, there was a temptation in that. I wouldn't doubt it, but he wasn't. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. That, that kind of gets to the core of why. Paul wasn't trying to hold on to his life in the world. Experiences I have myself. Come across people that we're talking, and they, they begin to see these things, and they have it's building up their soul, and somebody, the institutional person, tells them, well, this probably isn't the best thing for you to be listening to Brother to Ricky Sims. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. This could be a disability, and they turn they turn away. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh yeah, I've experienced it a whole lot. I'm sure several here have. Mm -hmm. And the people warn them, <coughs> just like those prophets did. See, Paul. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that should just say, "Whoa, the Lord must be leading me on in this." Yeah, that's right. I mean, if you got a clear understanding of what your course is. That's right. Aside. That's right. If you know you're doing what God's called you to do and you love God, you won't be turned aside. That's what we see here. God won't mislead you. Right. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Even, um, even in the world, <laughs> there's a certain kind of a race they call it an obstacle course. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Amen. Now, notice the language here because it's very consistent with the language leading up to our text. And by the way, everything I've said right now is just background. Okay, this is just background. I'm just giving you an illustration of this love. That's what I'm doing here, okay? But notice the familiarity of the language to what Paul says to Timothy when he comes to the end of his life. So that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now, it's one thing to say, I don't count my life as dear unto myself. I don't. It's another thing for that to be lived out and carried out. Paul in 2 Timothy is approaching the end of his life in the world. Mm -hmm. When he told these Ephesian elders, my departure is at hand, okay? When he told the Ephesian elders that, he's not talking about, I'm just not coming back to this area. I'm, I'm, I'm departing and I'm leaving off, to, I'm going to, back toward Jerusalem, I'm not coming back here. That's not what he means. He means I'm leaving the world. I'm leaving the world. And it's the same thing that she says to Timothy. He's coming close to the end of his life, 
and he's going to die. My departure is at hand. And Paul's not going to die a common death. This isn't, I'm close to the end of life, I'm old, I've got this disease, and I'm getting ready to die. This is a death, a capital punishment type of death. He's going to be killed by ungodly men. He's in prison awaiting this execution. Now, I am very interested in what drives a man to be faithful in ministry in life and to come to the end of his life and for the same thing to be driving him to not be concerned about his life and his death, but to have this kind of love which is stronger than death. Because Paul has come to the end of his life and he's not talking about how bad the conditions are in prison. He's not talking about those things. About how unjustly he was treated in life. Certainly you've seen this. Men, they come into some kind of injustice and it throws them off. And so that's all they talk about. Some men, it's just something as small as like a disease. They get some kind of disease and it throws them off. That's all they ever talk about is the trouble they're going through in their life. Remember there when Paul was in prison? He didn't say, I'm very cold here. He said, bring the cloak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a lot of difference, isn't it? Right, Amen. that's right. Mm -hmm. So Paul comes to the end of life, and here's what's driving him, and here's what's always been driving him. Henceforth there is laid up for me, that is, henceforth, after his death, <laughs> it's good to have an ambition that drives you all the way through life. Amen. You're... Your desire will only drive you as far as what's become the object of your love. Okay? I, I didn't, this is just something I'm, I've, I've seen this as I've gone through first Sean. This becomes very apparent. But you see how deadly an earth-centered religion is? Why can't people get off the earth? Because the object of their love is earth-centered. That's why they can't. And you can't go any farther than that which is the object of your love. If your intention is to actually lay hold on eternal life, your affection has to be fueled by something that is eternal. Amen. Has to be. The appearing of Christ is a line of demarcation between temporal and eternal. It is a line of demarcation between what is mortal and what is immortal. It is a line of demarcation between what is seen and what is unseen. And Paul says, my longing extends out after my departure. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give unto me in that day, but not unto me only, but to all they that love his appearing. Okay, so let me tell you what, what, what this is. God sets up certain people as examples of certain aspects of God, certain traits of God. Paul is an example of a number of things. He's an example of how much a man can receive from God by way of understanding. You know, I, he, he understood a lot. He was given a lot, see, of what, what, a, what kind of a capacity man has to receive understanding from God. He was also an example of how a person can receive abundant grace and what grace does in the life of a person. I labored more abundantly than they all. But Paul is also, in our text, an example of how much a person is willing to go through by perceiving the love of God to respond in love to go through anything to obtain what God has prepared Amen. for them that love him. And that's what he is in our text. Amen. That's what he set up. That's why I say I don't mean for this to be a suffering to be the subject. I don't want us to go off in that direction. I'm just saying that Paul was, I will show thee how much you must suffer me for me is Jesus setting up Paul as an example of when a man receives an understanding of the love of God, how he is compelled within to go through anything to obtain the God who has so loved him. And that's why he says what he says here. Okay. He'd been chosen to declare the unsearchable riches of Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were precious few people that he actually got to tell those to. Yeah, amen. Now you, 
I've been kind of this way, but other people may have to give them. You need to, you need to soften your stuff up some if you want to have some influence. Mm -hmm. you don't make your writings in that so long. And <coughs> Paul was faced with <coughs> that on a much larger scale, but it boils down to this. Well, I'm not sent to those kind of people. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The message I have isn't for those kind of people. Uh -huh. We've got the Gospels for everybody, but the unsearchable riches of Christ, I, you're down a little bit deeper on that. That okay. isn't for everybody. Mm -hmm. It is. It's just for people that have, are in the sun. Right. right. So that, if you're going to labor for the Lord, you got to make up your mind. Mm -hmm. Who's this for? If you've got a message that is just for everybody, it's not going to be a very profound message. Mm -hmm. It really mm -hmm. isn't. Right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Peter uh, said something uh, very profound about suffering. He said, if need be. If need be. So for a season, if, if need be. Mm -hmm. Now that discretion of if is up to the Lord, not to us. Right? Amen. And the, it, it speaks volumes. It means that the, the suffering has a design. Yes. Yes. To it. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the Lord is not reacting to us. I think mm -hmm. maybe maybe not not expressed, but I think a lot of people think suffering just results if you've done something wrong. It's just kind of retribution. Uh, you you disobey and you suffer. Mm -hmm. And so if you if I do well, then I won't suffer. Now they might mm -hmm. not say it like that, but I think mm -hmm. that's yeah. it's like it's like ingrained in the mm -hmm. in, in the conscience maybe, but. Suffering has it has a quality of disconnecting you from from the world, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so if need be, see that that opens up like like a whole new landscape mm -hmm. of uh, uh, of experiencing sufferings. If you know that this this has come to you by the Lord's discretion, He's decided if this this is needed. Mm -hmm. at this time. So yeah. to connect that to your, to your text, that if this suffering is effective in disconnecting me from the world, it, it's also at the same time enabling me to more fully love His appearing. Mm -hmm. yes. Amen. That's right. That's right. Paul's not an island unto himself. That's what I'm getting at. He's not. This is a man of God that walks by faith, being willing to endure what he needs to endure to obtain the prize at the end. Okay, don't look at him as some Superman. He's, it's not. It's a man that walks by faith. The intensity of what he, the, the quantity of what he received and the intensity of his love, no doubt, it was great. I wouldn't doubt it was unparalleled. I wouldn't doubt that at all. But the general substance of it, this is true of all men. This is why he can say, and not unto me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Okay, so this is, this is not just Paul's love, this is the love of believers. This is, that's, that's what I'm talking about here. Okay, this is the love of all his people. The psalmist said, enlarge my heart, remember? Mm -hmm. So some people love God with all their heart, but their heart's little. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Paul's heart was big. That's so right. When he said this, see this. <laughs> this meant a lot more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you look at Paul, look at him, and see what kind of the capacity the new heart has. That's right. Think of that. When you think about that small heart, think of that. What kind of capacity this heart has to be enlarged? Because your heart is enlarged through understanding and through difficulties we talked about. But that's that's what enlarges it. Okay, and we see that in the Apostle Paul. Now, endurance is a mandate from heaven. That's a mandate. Okay, Jesus Himself said, "Here's the commander in chief." He that endures to the end shall be saved. Okay? And so I'm telling you, God in his wisdom has provided this very difficult context in which we are living in order to show forth the greatness of his love when it gets into a man. Of what a man does. This brings glory to God, brethren. One of the ways your treasure for God is you treasure God and you love him. One of the ways that's manifest is by what you're willing to go through to stay on course and to love God. There have been people that have not been knocked off course, been knocked off. Is that because God wasn't faithful? Is that because salvation didn't provide for them? 
No, it's because our love is too small. It's too small. But I'm telling you, love isn't too small in Christ. So whatever God is calling you to pass through, you will be able to do it. Whether a fervent affection, as Song of Solomon said, <laughs> that love will be able to pass through many waters and it won't be quenched. Okay, I, I'm thankful, Brother Aaron, that you brought that text up. That was such a marvelous text. You take that to its highest understanding, and we're not talking about the relationship between a husband and, and a wife. We're talking about the relationship between Christ and his church. And they do have to pass through many waters, but that's going to bring all the more glory to God. See, that's, that's, that's what I wanted to say by looking at Paul, okay? Now, moving on from that, <clears throat> driving compulsion, this kind that we see here, is not unique to Paul. And here's where I want to go with this next. The work of salvation prepares men for Christ's appearing by giving them a dominating love for God and for his son. Okay, that's where I want to go now. Because this has always been the determination of God, that God would dwell with men and men with God in an unrestricted glory. So God in his wisdom has made a provision for a man to come to the end of his life and to in full confidence be fully prepared to enter into the presence of the Lord without fear. That's what Paul's doing. He's at the end of his life. <laughs> And he's getting ready to enter in, but he, he's not afraid of this at all. Simply because he's given himself, he's given himself, brethren, to this great work of salvation. Paul is part of the workmanship of God in Christ Jesus, just like we are. And so God has prepared Paul as he will prepare all of us <laughs> to be ready to receive Christ with a marvelous and warm reception when he comes without fear. Salvation prepares us for that. Okay, and that's, that's, what I, that's where I want to go with this now. Sister June. This salvation is so great until new aspects of it kind of open up um, from kind of like all the time, but sometimes larger pieces of it are seen. Mm -hmm. We're talking about being prepared for the coming of the Lord, which means being prepared for the presence of God, because that's what's going to happen yep, yep. at his coming. Right. Mm -hmm. We're going to appear without any kind of, of barrier or buffer. Just either we're in Christ or we're not in Christ. Mm -hmm. And so we're prepared or we're not prepared. But the point of preparation is to be like Him. Mm -hmm. To be in mm -hmm. full agreement and fellowship with Him. Right. That's what's going to make us prepared. Mm -hmm. And that is done solely in Christ. But you, you think of, you think of uh, whenever, whenever man sinned, it affected God. He had to suffer us, so to speak. He, he still is long suffering until his purpose is, is completed. Whenever Jesus came, you saw him suffering the contradiction of sinners against himself. Mm -hmm. All right, now, Christ actually participated in the na nature of man experientially. Uh, we, I'm not as clear uh, exactly what kind, of, but I, I know he was vexed, he was grieved. That's a form of suffering. Mm -hmm. it, everything can be happening really, really well around you. But if you are sorely vexed and grieved, you're suffering for some reason. Mm -hmm. It's the yeah. effect of it. Yeah. It's as though in allowing us and prescribing for us, if you will, uh, sufferings that uh, to to participate in that, that or have fellowship with the sufferings of Christ that he, he leaves behind. It's as though we're being brought into uh, to fellowship with the greatness of God's heart. Yeah. It's like our hearts are being conformed to his heart in yeah. this. Right. And there's part of that preparation mm -hmm. for the day of his coming. Amen. And the, and they the sufferings are actually ministers to us as we as we experience them in Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's right. Amen. Brother Ricky. Yeah. Yeah. I think maybe um, this is just my own opinion, but when we get to glory, we'll only really start to understand really what the suffering Christ had. 
because we're getting a little taste now. So it, it's kind of like preparing us, you know, to be able to understand what he really did. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can see part of it now, but then we're going to really see what it cost and what it what it, what it was, what how much he actually did suffer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll see more of the fullness of that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he endured the contradiction of sinners for 30 years before his ministry. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Amen. So it wasn't just in the cross. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, when Mary and Joseph came and found him, and even her words, your father and I have sought thee sorrowing. That affected him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, it did. You know? Yeah. <clears throat> That's right. He said, I must be about my father's business. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, did and you, you forget who do. I am? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, amen. Of course, he was 12. Yeah. 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 Started early, didn't he? Now, there, the, this dominating love for God is a requirement. Brother Mike, you mentioned this. I, I was glad for that word. It was That was very good because I'd been thinking about that. And it's it's to them that love is appearing. That's a very unique way of looking at the believer, you know. To them that love is appearing, they're the ones that are going to receive the crown of righteousness. That's the, why he said that's very important. Now, this love is a requirement. Let's just look at this for just a moment. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that love God, and who are called according to his purpose. That's what the, who they work out for. That's, what, that's what all, how all things work for good, is for those people, to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. How about this one, Ephesians 6, 24. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. That truly do. Mm -hmm. Well, you get in a lot of trouble if you came into places you said that. Who does he give grace to? Those that love him in sincerity. That, that's who get the grace. Them that love him in sincerity, truly, from the heart. They genuinely do, in fact, love him. Okay? Let me give you another one. Here's a negative example. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. Hmm? Condemnation. Let him be damned if he doesn't have this love. How about that for a word? It's quite a qualification. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm crying about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. Oh well, yeah, some people can't see this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm showing you that this this is an issue of life and death here. That's right. <clears throat> Love in Christ. So whether you receive grace or not, whether God works it all out for your good or not, or whether you're damned or not. This love. Transferred over to Christ. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're in times like that. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. And of course, our text before us. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them that love mm -hmm. his appearing. Okay? Why is he mentioned that? And why is it connected with such critical matters as life and death, condemnation or being saved, receiving grace or not? Why, why is it connected to such central things like this? Because of this. Because the work of salvation gives a person the capacity to love just like this. It gives them this kind of capacity to do this. I know that we all grow in this capacity, but it gives you this kind of capacity, okay? To love God so that you are compelled and driven in life by this love, okay? I know you've got to increase in it. I know that, but see, that's what I'm saying, is that the work of salvation, as a person avails themselves of it, this is what it does in them. It produces this kind of love, okay? So let's look at this for just a second. Look at how salvation prepares a man and gives them this kind of a capacity. For one, as we've been talking about, as we've been looking through this, this has been mentioned a number of times by the brethren, is that we've been given a new heart. A man in the flesh can't love God. You cannot love what is contrary to your nature. You cannot do this. You can't. Okay? That's why in the scriptures it's recorded, he that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Why is he doing what is right? Because he loves what is right. All men do what they love. That's the truth. And so he gives us a new heart. Okay? And a new spirit. He says, a new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. 
I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. What is the effect of that? I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. How about that? What is the love of God? His commandments aren't grievous. Why not? Because he's given us a new heart. Yes, it's true. The heart is desperately wicked above all else, but that's not the heart you got in Christ. That's right. Right? Right. Amen. You've been, brother, you've been given a new heart, and in that heart comes this capacity to love what God loves. Hey, God loves his commandments. All the things he says, he loves them. You saw this in Christ. Huh? He exalted the law and honored it. When he lit, why? Because he loved the, the Father. You see it in David. Why, why would David spend so much time going over the law? I know that's more than his commandments, but, that, but that's what he had as a revelation at the time. Because he loved God. See, that's the capacity he's given us. He's given us a new heart, and that new heart comes with this capacity to love God, which is manifested by a submission to, to his commands, to love the way he's directing us, and to do them. A person that's not doing the commands of God and professes to be a believer is a contradiction. Yeah, it's a contradiction. Right. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's a, that's a contradiction, brethren. Something's not, something's not right there. When you love God, you love his commands because you have this heart for doing it, and we have that heart. Um, also, another very important thing, another text that I've been looking through a lot lately that I've enjoyed is John 17, Jesus' prayer. Here, Jesus is getting ready to establish this great foundation for salvation by dying for the sins of his people and taking them away. And so he's anticipating what's going to come, the glory that shall follow, as Peter said. He's anticipating that. And so he's speaking about it. And he says in John 17, 6, and I want you to notice there's something that Jesus keeps coming back to in this, okay? He says, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. So he is associating keeping his word with the manifestation of his name. You notice that? Notice that? Huh? Respectfully dedicated to Pentecostals. We need to give more attention to the word than to experience and let the word direct our experience rather than vice versa. Okay? Verse 8, I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they believe that thou didn't send me. So there, there's some commentary on what this word is. It has to do with Christ. It has to do with the fact that he was sent by God. It has to do with that, that he's the premier man. That, that comes across in his word, and they received that. How do you know? Well, what did Peter say? To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life. He received that word. Haven't you received that word too? That's right. But I'm telling you, it's centered around the word, that word. Okay, that, that's, that's what I'm getting at here. A whole multitude left him because of what he said. It was hard. The saints were hard. Yeah, so they left. So that's, a, that's why people leave Christ. That's They're right. Still leaving them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, if you don't understand it, it yeah. is hard. Verse 13 and 14. Now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. How about that? He associates the joy that drives and compels him in life. And brethren, this is the same joy that Paul was talking about in Hebrews, Hebrews when he said, for the joy that set before him, he endured the cross. Same joy. Same joy. He wants them to be moved along by the same understanding that drives and compels him right through the cross. Brethren, I'm talking to you about fellowship and love. Speak these things in the world. Right. He wasn't saying I speak these things to the world. That's not what he's still talking about the disciples. Right, right. that's right. Yeah. But they were in the world, and that's when he, he spoke these to these disciples. Mm -hmm. But that's to them all the way through there, while they were in the world. Right. Mm -hmm. Where they're at. That's right. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. 
I have given them thy word. That's verse 14. I have given them thy word. Brethren, he's going back over this again. Here is the son speaking directly to the father, and he's emphasizing something. Our ears need to perk up at this. There's something very specific that Jesus is driving at here. And the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So now, not only does he associate us having the same joy that he has because of the word, now he associates the retaliation of the world against his people because of their reception of this word. I've given them my word, and the world hath hated them. Why? Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. How about that? That's, that's pretty marvelous right there. In other words, this was a clash of natures that is associated with the word of God. What are we born of? The word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Verse 17. I hope this is making sense to you. Uh, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Verse 20. Neither pray I thee for these alone. In other words, this isn't just unique to the apostles. But for them also, which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be what? One. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, that they may be one. Let me give a commentary on that. One is singleness in affection and love, driven by the same thing. Moving in the same direction. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Why are they agreed? Because they love the same thing. The word has produced that in us. I'm telling you, one of the things, brethren, that has worked this kind of love in us is an understanding of the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. I don't think you can have an understanding of the truth and not love it. I don't think you can. I don't think you could support from the scriptures as anyone else can. Because they work together. That understanding comes with a deep love toward God. And it, it like the word does, the scripture refers to the word as like leaven. Doesn't it? Well, it is that way too in our hearts. The Son of God has come and given us an understanding in order that we might know him that is true. And we are in him that is true even in his son. This is the true God and eternal life. You're telling me that you can have eternal life, as some men claim, and not love what God loves and not be driven primarily by what God's driven by? Now, I, I understand Philippians 3. I understand that. If any man has any other view, God will make this clear to them. But he will make it clear to them. And when it's not clarified and people go on and they don't have this love and they don't have this dominant drive in life, at least we say this, something's not right here. Something's not right here. This is what eternal life is. It involves a communion with God based on a harmonious affection. He longs for the appearing of his son. Right? We do too. See, brother, I'm telling you, that is the work of salvation in a man, to produce that. And it centers around this truth, this love for the truth. See, we love the truth. How can you love something that you don't understand? Okay, does that make it clear? You can't. You can't. Your love will only extend to the borders of your understanding. It can't go beyond that. How could it? It can't go beyond that. And so he, he comes and he gives us an understanding. Now we're one with him. We love what he loves, and we're compelled like he's compelled in life. See? And we're longing for his appearing just like, just like he longs for that appearing. See, there isn't love between two who don't love the same thing. That's, how can that be? Can't. Can't be. So salvation has worked these things in us. Another thing that salvation has brought to us is faith. We've received like precious faith. Okay? It's like our spiritual sense. I think somebody here said this this weekend, talked about this, how a, a man's understanding can't go beyond his senses. You can't. You can't, know, you can't know something that is beyond your senses. So God has made a marvelous provision because God's a spirit. 
not, he's not detected by five senses unless he makes an accommodation, which is a very unusual thing. Very, and when it is, it, it like jars the flesh. This is a very difficult thing. But that's what faith is. Brother Aaron, Brother Aaron, you brought this out. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Okay, it is. Why, brethren, why don't people cherish these things? Why don't they love them? I know that can be a lot of things, but here might be an answer. They don't have faith. I'm telling you, without faith, this is nothing but fairy tale. It's not real to people that don't have faith. It's not, because there's no way that your heart can come to a convincing understanding of these things without faith. Okay? That's what makes this substance. You, know you want to know why people don't live for this. They don't live for this. They don't love this. They don't talk about this. And you do, and you can't understand why they don't. Maybe this is why. It's not real to them. They may say it's real. They may say they have faith. But after it's all said and done, the conversation puts a lie to the profession. Because when a man walks by faith, and he, like Moses, is down in Egypt, which was laden with all the good the world had to have it, that had to give to man at that time, he endured, the scripture says, not only <laughs> rejecting all these carnal pleasures, but incurring the indignation of the most powerful man in the world. How so? He endured as seeing him that is invisible. Faith. It brought home the reality of these things. Amen. Brethren. And when that reality comes home, it fuels your affection for the Lord. That's what, that's what I'm saying. It, does. it fuels that affection. You love the Lord. This is faith which worketh by love. Okay. It's what you see by faith that fuels your love for these things. And so in all this, you can see salvation is working in men to develop this very kind of affection that compels us to come to the end of life and say, here's the one thing I want, and this is what I lived for all my life to the degree that I came to the Lord and was walking by faith is this. I love his appearing. I love his appearing. Salvation prepares men for that very thing, okay? A professing believer who does not love God above all else is a living contradiction of what the work of salvation is all about. That's the bottom line. And here we would be wise not going to compare ourselves with ourselves. Just don't look, just don't limit your understanding to the generation you're, you're in because this is a fallen generation. Well, I guess this is normal that people are like this. No, this is not normal that people are like this. You gotta think about what the work of salvation is all about. It's preparing men for the day of Christ's appearing. It's preparing men for that, okay, and getting them ready. I'm telling you, whoever has obeyed the gospel, when Jesus comes again in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel, he will receive a warm reception from them who have availed themselves of the great work of salvation. They shall, in the words of the apostle through the Spirit, admire him at his appearing. Amen. That is what they're living for. They're living for that. Okay? I know you're looking forward to that time, too. That's going to be, that's going to be a wonderful day for all of us. Brother Tony. something just got through saying that... Uh, a man can't understand anything outside of his, the senses God has given him, but he's made a provision for the things he gives. Mm -hmm. He's given us the, uh, the Spirit of, of the Lord. He's given us the Spirit of God mm -hmm. to minister these things that come only from him. That's right. Yeah. You know, this is, this is uh, th that's a key thing there. That's why I wanted to comment on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't want to be thinking out loud, you know. I, I want to be able to make an insightful comment. So I'm thinking that uh, you got to have a preference for the things of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that preference yeah. has got to be centered in Christ. So mm -hmm. anything, and then, uh, and keep in view that the Holy Spirit's working. He's really, he's yeah. highly sensitive about the Lord, you see. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so if we get off on a subject that's not like Christ-centered, then these things we get from Christ, <laughs> that means we have a preference for something else yeah. then, because uh -huh. we're off-centered. So then we can't expect really... Uh, the, the spirit to minister these things when we're talking about the love of God and then we're pursuing God, we, we're pursuing the mm -hmm. love of God in Christ. And you know, what made me think about it, we, we know so many, so many people who are uh, struggling with understanding the love of God and they get off on all these kind of things that, 
just we know this not you know all these other kind of things we talk about mm -hmm. it, but they're, what they're doing they're, they're they're struggling with trying to understand this love of God. You remember mm -hmm. that place, and we you never yeah. really could put your hands on it, yeah. but that's because the preference. It's messed up, and the that's Holy right. Spirit's not that's ministering right. there. Right. You see, right. you never will yeah. mm -hmm. get it yeah. unless you get unless you can get uh, your preference to get back on Christ again. Right. Amen. That's right. And I understand this: nobody, nobody is going to admire Him and His coming who didn't love Him above all else. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 It's a great kingdom secret that we just been discussing there. Mm -hmm. The great kingdom secret. That you'll find that there's a some people you'd be very disappointed when you find out, but they have other priorities right. <coughs> that bleed off. Yeah. It bleeds off their energies. Yeah. Yes. And so they're, so to speak, fatigued when they get around to you know, exposed to the things of God. They're wore out from all of the mm -hmm. cares of the world. Yes. Uh -huh. Other things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a great kingdom secret. This, this preference. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. I'm saying this is what salvation works in men. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. No one's going to come to the end and say, I availed myself of Christ. Yeah. I kept the truth. I loved the truth. I fought the good fight of faith. And I don't really love his appearing. And I, I, I wasn't able to live primarily for him because of that. No one's going to come to that day and say that. When a person has lived with divided affections, and truly, that just means that there's something else they love more. It doesn't mean they've given 50 to God and 50... You can't live that way. Nobody can live that way. You can't portion your affections equally to things. You're going to love something above all others. And when someone has done that, they're going to come to the end of life. And when God rolls back their life, it's going to prove that their lie, their profession was simply a lie. Yes. Okay, Sister Barb. Only one disciple didn't stick to Jesus and he was appointed to something else. That's right. right. Hey. His own place, which is where his affection lies. Yeah. 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 I was thinking about this yesterday during Brother Gene's sermon also because he was speaking that if the love of the world is in a man, then the love of the Father is not in him. Mm -hmm. It cannot yeah. be in him. Mm -hmm. Because going back to this capacity that you mentioned, the Lord gave men the capacity to love. But when they direct it for something other than God, then that capacity is marred and corrupted. It's defiled. Then it has to be repaired in order to be given back to the Lord Himself, where right. it was initially supposed to be placed. That's right. Amen. 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 So very complex matters these are what we're talking about. Um, is, is this clock right? Is it 1026? Okay, let me wrap it up just real quickly. Okay. The fact that he says appearing means that there is, a, there is a sense in which the things of God are concealed at the present time. Okay? Uh, remember God told Moses, I, I, as I grow in Christ, my love for Moses increases very greatly. Show me your glory. Mm -hmm. Show me your glory. You thought, well, all he wanted there was he just wanted some, to know that God was going to be with him and lead him and guide him. And that was one of the issues there. If you look back over Exodus 33, you'll see that. That was the issue. If you're not going up with us, don't go with us. But after he had told him, God had told him, I'm going to go with you. Yeah. And after that, Moses says, show me thy glory. I want to see more. I want to see more. I don't doubt that Moses wanted, to, he wanted, a, he wanted a full face revelation. He wanted to see as much as he could see. And God said, no man can see my face and live. Mm -hmm. And that has been the manner up to date, brethren. That, the, the kingdom doesn't come with observation. Jesus said, the world seeth me no more. And the scripture says of us that we prophesy in part. No matter how much understanding you've come to in Christ Jesus, you've just got a part. Okay? You've just got part of it. You don't have the whole of it. It doesn't mean that what you have isn't real. It's not that. But I'm saying everything that's been known about God to date is an abbreviation to what's coming. The day of his appearing, brethren, the day of his appearing is his appearing. It's his appearing. Jesus says, every eye shall see him, even they that pierced him. He's going to sit on the throne of his glory. His kingdom is going to be manifested. Everyone's going to know who's Lord in that day. See, it's going to be fully made known. And here's the driving compulsion in life for the believer. What he has seen to God to date, presently, is driving him on to see more. 
until the day of his appearing brings the full revelation of his person to men. For the ungodly, it will be the worst day of their life because they haven't loved these things and because they're not righteous. And a fire goes out before him and devours everything that's unlike him. But if you have been made righteous and like him, and the day of his appearing brings that body that we long to have that's like unto his glorious body, you'll be changed in the moment in a twinkling of an eye. And you'll see in that day what kind of a value the work of righteousness has had when you stand before the presence of his glory unrestricted and you joy in God. Hey, the ransom of the Lord, they're going to come and return to Zion with joy, with everlasting joy on their heads. What is Zion? It's the city of God. It's the place where God is known and seen. And it's going to bring joy. And if an unrighteous man was brought into that city, it, would bring, it wouldn't bring joy, I can tell you. It'd bring trouble, like it will when Jesus has appeared. So this has been the driving compulsion for believers all through history. I'm amazed at what Job knew. And I'll just, just say a few things, and then I'll give you a few more comments, and we'll be done. Job was a man that walked by faith. And with what little was made known about God, he was able to say this, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And that he shall stand on the earth in the last day. Now, I don't know how Job knew that. But somehow he did. And in the midst of all kinds of trouble and trial and suffering, the floods and waters of suffering did not quench his love for his God. He's looking forward to this revelation. Mm -hmm. And how much more so is it true in Christ when we're living in the day the time when the true light now shineth. Everybody that's a true believer is living for that revelation. They long for it. Now I'm telling you, you commit yourself to the work of salvation. We're talking about the love of God. Well, here's like the pinnacle of it. Is to love his appearing and to love him when he does appear and to not shrink back in shame. This, brethren, is the boldness that we may have in the day of judgment, as John said, because as he is so are we in this world. There's salvation. We're like him. We love what he loves. He's longing for that appearing. And we are too. So we're encouraged by this to continue to submit ourselves to the things that make that love toward God flame. And it has to do with what you see in his love. We love him because he first loved us. So I'm, I'm glad for this time that we've had. I'm glad for every time we preach, we come together and preach the gospel because it always causes our love for God to kind of swell and kind of expand that much more. It's preparing us for that day. Amen. Brother Tony. Yes, to see him now. Brother Ricky develops a love. Well, we love, we love what we see of him now. Mm -hmm. And uh -huh. immediately when we come into the kingdom, we, we get something for Christ. We love it. Mm -hmm. And then we pursue these things and we get more of him. And, and so by the, the, the idea is, and my thinking is, is we love him, this love will increase that we'll, we'll love his appearing then because we've learned to love him because yeah. of what we see of him yeah. now. And, and see, right. and for those who haven't gotten anything from Christ and they haven't learned to love him, and so then they won't love him when he comes. So if that, uh, if that makes any sense, it's, yeah. it's, it's rather simple, you know. God has did it in a way, it's rather simple to understand, but it's a very complex thing, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Surely you know this as if you've tried to look into this, what love, yeah. the love of God is. There are so, there are so many connections to it that it's, it is complex, brother. Yeah. It is. Brother Judah. If you have a preference for the things of God and put forth an effort to, to find them, then God will give them to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you should say, if you seek, then you will find. Mm -hmm. So if you have a preference for the things of God... And you try to find it, God will give you to find it because He won't withhold what the body needs. He'll, he's always going to give it to him. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Sister Sarah. When, uh, when men are not with God, they are dull and do not know Him, which means that they don't love Him. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. I, th I think Sister Ruth had her hand up a minute ago. I was just going to say a while ago when you said that. Uh, Every eye shall see the Lord when he comes back. 
that knocks out the secret rapture. Yeah. Yes. A lot of people yeah. talk about that. That's right. That's right. No secret. No secret. Everybody's going to know. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 And it'll be yes. one way or the other. We'll be glad to see or we'll yeah. cry for the rocks to fall. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Amen. That's right. You want it to be secret? I mean, if you love is a period, you really yeah. want it to be secret. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else this morning? Amen. I was just saying about being convinced. You can't love anything unless you're convinced about it. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. You have to be yeah. convinced. And this is the work of salvation is God convincing his people of the truth. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Amen. All right. Thank you, brethren, for your comments. Appreciate it. Father, we thank you for the truth that's here. We're grateful for the great salvation that you're working in the earth so that men can come to the end of life and be fully confident and be ready to meet their God. Father, we are thankful for Christ Jesus who works all this work in us. If we boast, we boast in the Lord. And we are so thankful that we are your workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We look forward to Christ appearing. Help us to continue to faithfully hold up the gospel of Christ and to preach, Father, to those that love his appearing to stir their love for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.